All right. It says we're live. So in the words of the great Art to Bear, we are live. I guess I don't. I don't know. Hello, Michael in Poland. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. Oops, I can hear myself. That's a problem. All right. So this is the first episode of uh, what? Oh my gosh, what are we calling this? Between ballads and history, we're gonna cover. Yes. We're gonna look at some of the Arthurian legend. Uh, that is the plan. Uh, I am your resident Arthurian nut. I am Michael Odin, uh, creator writer of Elysian Fields, a little bit of mythology aficionado, and uh, Blue brought us here to talk about mythology and history. So I'll turn this over to Poland, who's our historian guy. Poland. Poland How's it going, guys? Poland and I did a stream where we got into history, and that was so good that it sparked this idea. So thanks for being here, Poland. What's your background? So my background is that I hang out with Blue and Michael Bancroft uh, most days <laughs> during the week. But outside of that, I have a degree in history, uh, and I still love it, even though that's not what I'm involved with in my career at the moment. And as Blue said on one of our unboxing streams, actually, we started talking a little bit of history, a little bit of Carthage, because another one of my monikers online is Hannibal. You may see that occasionally on Twitter. It's Carthaginian conservative. So that is uh, that's another field that I am very interested in. So when he proposed this idea of getting together with Michael Odin, who's a subject matter expert on Ethereum legend, I thought it was a great thing to get involved with, especially considering that you know, comic books in a lot of ways are kind of our own modern mythology. So I thought it was very appropriate. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, Paul, I don't even remember which was the first time that we actually got a chance to talk, but it was like, I, I remember when this whole thing was proposed, it was, uh, I was, we were doing the mailing list thing for pyramid gambit and blue was like, Hey, have you talked to Poland about history yet? And I was just like, huh? And so then you got brought on and we went back and forth and, you know, it's, it's honestly been just a fantastic experience. You know, Paul and I actually had a fantastic discussion, uh, kind of breaking down how this was going to work here about a week and a half ago. And it just went on like six or seven different tangents about all sorts of different avenues of history and everything. It was an absolute blast. Um, he, he really knows his stuff, but, uh, yeah. So the, the big main event, um, well, Blue, do you want to introduce yourself? This is your show, technically. Oh, yeah, um, I'm here not to be the star, but more to be the moderator. That's why. That's why they're on top. And so, uh, basically, it's. it's I, I wanted this. to. Huh? <laughs> 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 I didn't catch that. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's better that way. Um, <laughs> anyway, I I'm kind of the ignorant knave here. I haven't read the Arthurian legends, so when I first proposed this, it was for any story, and then. Uh, Arthurian legends was suggested, I think, by our our probably the Arthurian nut, and then uh, it was all right. That'll just be our first story, and uh, I thought that it would be good to to dive into the background in history that surrounded the origins of some of the the stories that have really shaped Western civilization. So, you know, we'll, we'll generally address certain questions like when was the, when did the story come about? What was going on? In history, um, you know, lar large and small, when it was being written, stuff like that. Uh, si why is Simon Poitier going to abandon us, uh, even though he's so in love with Arthurian legend? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. got got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he is. Sim, thanks, thanks for showing up, Sim. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Anyway, thanks uh, for stopping by. I I thought it'd be really really good stuff to dive into, um, and I realized I know two history nuts. This would be awesome. So. You know the, the best thing I learned from an investigator the best, that you always track names and dates, and it's like, well, that sounds like how history is done. Let's get these guys together and see if they have any interest in doing this. And then um, I kind of didn't bring it up for like a month again, and the, and, then, <laughs> and then I finally got off my butt and asked Michael if he'd be interested in it. So here we are. Anyway, yeah, um, no, and uh, so yeah, I think that that's a, a good way to kind of just start this off. Um, so this this episode, what we're our plan is is just to give everybody kind of a breakdown of how this is all going to work. Mm -hmm. Is that all of these stories have so much that there that we can talk about? So effectively, we're going to break this show down into effectively seasons. And so this first season, we're going to be doing Arthurian lore. And so this 
pilot episode is going to be where you should start origins. Um, and when you look at Arthur, it's a really, it's a really interesting topic because Arthur is this amalgamation of all these different people and stories and what have you. And so to really get an idea of, of how this all began is so, you know, the first real traces that we have of Arthur is in a story where he's not even mentioned by name. Um, there was an account of uh, Gildas and Baden, and I probably mispronounced Gildas there. I, I, my Welsh is not up to up to par. Um, I'm offended. But uh, they were found in this uh, this script called In De uh, In uh, the De Exidio et Conquestu Britannae. Uh, which and it kind of details this victory over um, these barbarians during sub-Roman Britain at the Battle of Baden Mountain. And so this account takes uh, was written about three centuries after the event took place. Uh, but again, there wasn't really a name uh, then. The first time that we really start to see the name Arthur attached to anything is in 828 uh, Anum Domine. Um, in which, uh, or AC, uh, or uh, was it AC or CE Common Era? Um, so, uh, Historia uh, Britonum was where we really start to find the name of uh, Arthur, start to get its name into legend, and it credits Arthur as being that leader that we saw uh, that, that was mentioned during the that that piece before at the battle of Baden Mount. But what was really interesting was, is that, you know, Arthur wasn't really described as a king there. He was uh, given the Latin title Dux Bellorum, which is a war commander. So it's a chief, um, but he fought alongside the Kings of Brit uh, of the Britons, as opposed to being the, the head King himself. Uh, we don't really start to see, uh, to see the King come into the legend until the very famous Joffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britannae, uh, which was this very weird British version of the Aeneid almost. It, like, it, like the whole idea was that you had the Trojan War happened as it what did, and then Aeneas goes off from Troy, and rather than finding Italy, he finds Britain. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so it, it goes down from the lineage of king, kings, allegedly from Aeneas, going all the way down. And then you have the story of the romantic Arthur. And that's where you get the things like, you know, Avalon and, uh, you know, the, the betrayal of Guinevere and all that stuff. And it's actually really interesting because, you know, I was doing research for this to make sure that I had everything polished. It was one of those things you look back and during this, um, you know, everyone knows uh, in modern culture that, you know, Lancelot in the more modern version of the story is the one that, you know, seduces Guinevere and what have you. But in this original version, it was Mordred um, uh, who had seduced Guinevere and got, uh, got uh, and tried to usurp the kingdom while Arthur was away conquesting in Northern Gaul. Okay. Um, well, hold on, hold on. But yeah. We just ran through a whole bunch of names <laughs> and I was trying to find my place on the notes you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. uh, it's, it's, it's right there at the tail end of uh, origins. Yeah. It's at the first line. <laughs> I had it, I had it under my keyboard. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, um, a, it's because uh, it's actually, yeah. Third, third bullet point. I, I have, I had sent out a script. I can go, I go through this stuff pretty quickly and I apologize about that blue. I'm not trying yeah. to confuse um, anyone, but, uh, but the, if, I, if I caught you right, okay. One of my functions, by the way, is, uh, audience ombudsman, which means yeah. I, I'm not just an ignorant knave. I pretend to be <laughs> an ignorant knave on top of that <laughs> for the sake of the audience to keep up with things when they start to flow too fast. And I'm new to this. I'm used to just like one-on-one -on -one interviews. So, okay. We were given a date of 828 and that is, uh, where the name Arthur first shows up in these accounts but he's not yes. a king. He's a war commander. Yes. Okay. And the war commander and was so, what you said, Dux Bellorum. Dux Bellorum is, uh, is what that title is. 
Okay. Um, and so then you start to see that shift into the kingship role through Jeffrey, uh, Joffrey Monmouth, uh, G E O R. Actually, let me pull that up so I don't mess this up. Uh, G E O F R E Y, and then Monmouth, M O N, M O U T H S uh, T H, and then his piece is Historia Regum Britannae. Um, typing that into the chat for people. A N A E. Oh yeah. Okay. And uh, so that's that's where you really start to see the beginnings of what we know of today as the Romantic Arthur. Okay. And the Romantic because it's the 828 is a really early date. I was not expecting this. So the current Uh so so Jeffrey Monmouth's is later than 828. I completely forgot to grab that. Give me just a second. I will pull up the date of that. The eight twenty eighth, the eight twenty eight date is for that. Um, three of the kings of Britain. So you've given us a note here that um, an account in that first one you named, which I typed in the chat, date eleven thirty six is when it was written. Ah, okay, we'll pencil that in. If I had a pencil. Anyway, you get you told us that uh, this early account in the uh, name I put in the chat was De Alexio a Conquista Britannae. Yes, um, that's an early account, but we the written copies of it are from three centuries later. So, so the 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 thing that happened was is that the first trace that we see of anything Arthurian is there is a excerpt from De Exidio et Conquistu Britannae. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an account of battles at Gildas and Baden Mount. Yeah. Um, and that, the, the, uh, that piece was written three centuries after the events had unfolded. Okay. So, um, and then later in 828, this shows up again with the name Arthur attached to it. Yes. And, and, and then in 828, you have, Historia Brita uh, Britannum, which is which was that next thing where you where you have the whole thing where it talks about sub Roman uh, a sub Roman Britain uh, Britannic leader named Arthur that was credited as leading that victory at Baden Mount. Okay, so we have a really wide spread there, and as you say, sub Roman meaning this is Britain yes. while Rome was in power. So Poland historically, <laughs> what? I mean, I just know grade school history here in terms of the fall of the Roman Empire. So what was going on in this spread from, let's say, the 500s through the 1100s in terms of Rome? And when did Rome actually fall? So, you know, people like to define things different ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a timeline guy. Yeah. 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 So Rome itself... You're going to see the fall of it around the the fourth to fifth century, mm -hmm. um, and then you get the Franks who kind of come in afterwards. That's where you get Charlemagne and everyone else. The Carolingians they're seen as kind of the successors to the to the Western Empire, and they actually end up breaking off from the East. Um, and Charlemagne ends up becoming kind of the Western emperor for a little just a brief span of time, and this is all you know, very early on. And in regards to England itself, uh, you have, as you might expect, um, several different uh, movements of people into the, the area after the, after the hegemony of Rome is really shaken after the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And so the Romans had been there really since around the time of Caesar or a little bit after really. Um, so they've been there for about 400 years. So you you have a, a real ch shift change that happens when it became, it went from a Roman Celtic society that existed in what we'd call Britain today to a Anglo-Saxon Celtic society. And this is where you see a lot of the names change. And a lot of the modern names of parts of England come from this Anglo-Saxon time period, you know, anything with ham at the end or 
or ton or ing. You know, they all have certain meanings in the Anglo-Saxon language at the time. Ham, for instance, means farm. Ing refers to people. Um, and so these different areas, they still carry these names today. Northumberland, Birmingham, Tottenham. So it's really this time period is really shaping what we'd come to know as England today. And England is kind of like a, or Britain, I should say more precisely, the whole island is kind of a seven layer cake in terms of <laughs> culture and language. And this is also during the time when the, the language itself, old English is coming into its own and what we would start to recognize. And this is also around the time when people begin to attribute things like poems coming about because now there's more words to actually to actually convey, you know, things that sound nice and pleasant to the ear. So around this time period, you get poems like Beowulf, for instance, yeah. uh, because now they can actually articulate certain things. And when you hear it, when you hear it in the old English, it actually sounds very appealing to the ear and something that people would like to read, but also like to hear orally as well. So this is all coming from the Anglo-Saxon incursion into what we know as England today or Britain more broadly. And this is again around the fifth century, but referring back to what Michael was saying about Gildas, the monk who wrote about the conquest of Britain, um, there wasn't much known about this period because no one was writing about it. So mm -hmm. this is why there is like that jump. So all those events from, you know, really before the fifth and sixth century are written about afterwards, but we do know the result. And that is England is much more Anglo Saxon as a result of what happened and what he wrote about. And that's where you start to see a lot of these stories. And what's interesting about the Arthurian legend is that, there's strong indications that it was obviously an oral story that was told as an anti Anglo Saxon story, right? Oh. It was supposed to be a repelling of them, but then later on it gets, it gets adopted by them as well. So the yeah, Anglo but, have to adopt that. And that's, that, that's all, that's also a fantastic way to tie into it as, uh, cause you know, as you said, like there's this, uh, there's a three century gap between the event and what Gildas wrote about in uh, in his account, and you know, there's no one human lifetime that's going to span that, which leads into Arthur himself, um, and going into those themes, you know, against the Saxons, against whomever you want it to be, but the big thing that you have is is that Arthur is really this kind of amalgamation of a few different people. Um, and I, I hope I didn't cut you off, Bolin. Uh, no, but it started, if I follow everything correctly, with in the fall of Rome, there's a conquest of England, or not a full conquest, but a battle in England uh, by somebody, the Romans, called the Battle of Baden Mount. And that seems yes. to be where all of this started. Yes. And so with, with that, we actually have... Um, so there are a few people that I'm that I call the men behind the myth, um, and uh, so there it's a whole list. There's four people that are kind of heavily theorized as being like the main inspirations for Arthur. Mm -hmm. The first is Lucius Artorius Castus. And I'll, I'll talk about each of these guys here after we kind of list them out, because I do want you to get a chance to write them down blue and make that easier for you. I have a, I have a um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rio Thamus, um, Ambrosius Aurelianus, and Artuir Mac Edan, I think is how that's pronounced. Again, Gaelic and Welsh, not my strongest suit, but I'm doing what I can based off of like the accent marks and what have you. Um, okay. So going back to man number one, Lucius Artorius Castus, this is actually where um, uh, it's theorized that the Welsh Arthur comes from. This connection was made from uh, a historian named Kemp Malone in 1924. And so this guy, Lucius Artor Artorius Castus, uh, Castus had uh, commanded a garrison 
that was headquartered in uh, at Boracum, modern day York, which is a mat, which has always been a massive fort, right? Okay. Um, and so he commanded a garrison of the sixth legion Victrix um, for for Rome, and you know as he was commanding a garrison up there, he was likely you know dealing with barbarian invaders from across the wall and what have you. That's around that time period where the the might of Rome was starting to dwindle and what have you. And especially with Britain being removed from the continent, it wasn't as easy to garrison. So the the big theory was is that you know you had Lucius Artorius Castus, who is the the root of the even name Arthur, and then the, uh, his idea was that the Knights of the Round Table were actually Sumerian cavalrymen that were under his command. What's the um, Sumerian? The, they're mercenaries. Oh, they're okay. like uh, like they were effectively they were mer they're like correct me if I'm wrong, Golden. Um, but they were mercenary cavalrymen come from all all, all across the empire. That's right. Okay, and this would. This is supposed to be who Arthur may have been in this year 500 ish event that wasn't yes. recorded until later. Now, well, actually, when, the year 500 event has actually been accredited to one of the later names on that list. Okay. But this was this guy did command because, as, as we established, there are so many different tales of Arthur. Mm -hmm. And they uh, like they all span during this three hundred year time uh, time lapse, and so the idea is is that this guy had commanded a garrison up towards the northern parts of England and was dealing with barbarian invaders, and this is where the myth starts. But the uh, the the there is a Ro uh, Brito Romantic figure that is credited with. Uh, being the commander at Baden Mount, uh, in uh, that we found, uh, called Ambrosius Aurelinus. Um, and we know that you know he was a very prominent uh Romano British warlord that uh is speculated to have been the commander of, of that uh Battle of Baden Mount, and uh, we we have this evidence because there's a lot of evidence throughout that region of his campaigns against the Saxons. So it's either that you know he was the person that led that battle, or it was definitely a part of his fight against the Saxons. He might not have been there. We don't like a, like again. This is a time period where it's called the Dark Ages for a reason. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the lights were off. We, we don't know like what's going on. Yeah. Like this what? is literally a lot of us just kind of throwing darts at a board. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, the church and hopefully it hits. The uh, church comes in when the church gets fully established, you know, a lot of historical records are either rejuvenated or maintained or actually written for the first time. But mm -hmm. there was a gap between the fall of the empire proper, Rome, and then the Catholic Church kind of come in there and filling that scholarly gap because a lot of the records we have, you know, are based from monks or, you know, saints who wrote about certain things or, you know, other priests who had the time to do these things and were, you know, furnished to do it as well. Yeah. Now, now that yeah. you, you've, the, I'm, I don't want to hammer too much on the Battle of Beta Mount or the, five, the year 500-ish thing, uh, except for I have an interest in linguistics. Um, I remember most of my history of English course. And I there's this thing about the Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S, the Celts, mm -hmm. and the, I forget how I wrote down this question earlier. If I had Twitter open, I could see my own notes. Um, but the Britons, the, um, uh, who, who else was they called? The, uh, the Celts. And then there's the invasion of those who brought their Germanic linguistic roots from yeah. Northern Europe over into england and i'm i'm wondering who are these people i want to get my name straight and, and tie down who was who uh, okay so the, who was natively on the island of, of of england or britain the the celts and the britons okay two different yeah. people groups like they, they were like the the britons were a celtic tribe okay like right. so the Kel the celtic tribes you had the gaul you had the the uh the britons 
and uh, Poland, it's the Irish, right? The Irish are the yeah. third Celtic tribe, yeah. right? Okay. And so the, the, the remnants of the Britons today are effectively the Scottish and the Welsh. Yeah. Okay. You also hear picks thrown around occasionally too. I, uh, yes, the, the, they're, they're also in there as well. But so, a lot of this gets kind of fuzzy because, mm. you know, you'll hear often like Celtic Britons. So Britons are like a subgroup of the Celts, but then some people use them interchangeably as well. Mm. But Britain is more precise language. Okay. So then who invaded bringing Germanic linguistic roots from a, from mainland Europe? Anyone? Or so, Saxon? Those yeah, they have the, the Anglo, we call them collectively now the Anglo-Saxons, but they'd probably be from what would be modern day Netherlands, like the, the Frisland yep. area. Okay. Um, and a lot of linguistic experts, that's where they trace it back to is, uh, I believe it's fr Frisland. Uh, it's, in, it's in the Netherlands, modern day Netherlands. And that's where they trace a lot of the roots back of Old English too, mm. um, is that area. Because I, I noticed... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Poland. I was just going to say around the end of the fifth century, uh, like I said, about time you have Gildas writing about it, they already have a strong presence and they ended up naming large portions of the country, Wessex, Sussex, Essex, Essex, I should say. And so those are all Anglo names. Yeah. I, uh, Bancroft recommended for us a series called something like the adventure of English, which you can find on YouTube. And uh, I, w I watched the first episode and I noticed there were things missing from it that I kind of remembered. And one of which was how did English and German have a common root? Because when I learned German, I noticed, oh, this is just, Eng you know, English without the French and Spanish in it. So um, I know that's kind of weird. But then you add on all the very specific, uh, what do they call endings on the on your adjectives and whatnot. So you can speak in a word order where word order is less of the syntax and and the end the uh, the endings added to words are more of the syntax so you can get keep your your uh, number gender and object type direct or indirect objects all straight and that's why in english we can put something at the beginning of a sentence for emphasis uh just like in german like if i'd said i am your father but i want to emphasize your father i'd say dein uh wanted bin ich instead of bin, ich bin deine vater like that yeah so um Sorry, I was thinking about uh, Star Wars for some reason. I have no, no idea. You're what all I'm good. <laughs> so, to be. so anyway, but then we also get our, our adverb order for, that's the same as German with the major adverbs being uh, yeah adverbs being time, reason, manner, and place. And that's the order they go in. So we have that in common with German. And then you just throw in a bunch of Latin terms and you get modern English after some digestion. So I've been, I've been kind of interested with who was who. And it's the Saxons, you're saying, who were invading. And then that... It, it's the the Saxons were invading at this time around the Battle of Baden Mount. Yes. Okay. Uh, is, is, like theor, theor, like like and it, we can't really narrow it down to like just the Saxons because again, you know, these stories you're going to see their original things start being like, you know, you had the Roman garrisons on Hadrian's Wall and they were fighting off the Scottish invaders coming up from the north. That was the whole reason why Hadrian's Wall was built, was to separate the civilized portion of southern Britain from its northern counterpart part, which had never really been settled very similar to how Germania was on the continent, okay. right? So, like, like, you know, while Rome had pacified Britain under the reign of Augustus, um, by the time of Hadrian and everything, things were just getting nuts up there. So that's why they built Hadrian's Wall. Uh, was because they were having enough of a hard time handling the expansion of the empire under Trajan as is. And so then Hadrian built the wall up on the northern, uh, to wall off the northern part of Britain, and then he reduced the size of the empire so that it could be more manageable. And that was the whole idea. And so when you have the these events that started around 500 CE, um, the start is things like, you know, you had the the um, the Scottish coming down from the north and what have you, but then you also have the whole thing where you had the Goth expansion, right? The Goth the Goths and Germanic tribes came from the west, being pushed out from where they were to to go, and you had the Franks going into Gaul and creating modern day, effectively modern day France, mm -hmm. and then uh, you had things like the Saxons 
that were taking to the seas and they were going over to England. And that's where you have the beginning of this rivalry, right? And so you have all these different people that are that are kind of uh, standing up against this foreign invader, standing up against the uh, the invading barbarian. It's this. It goes into what the, the really the core theme of King Arthur. When you strip away the the tales of gallantry, when you strip away the stories of knights and chivalry and what have you, the core to King Arthur myth is the struggle between civilization and chaos, mm -hmm. right? You, you have Arthur. Arthur and Camelot are representations of civilization, civilization that was brought by Rome, civilization that was brought by, that was upheld by the Britons, et cetera, et cetera. And then the common threat every single time is what? The barbarian horde. It doesn't matter who, who you, you, it doesn't matter who you dress them up as, whether it's the Scotch, whether it's the Pites, whether it's the, um, uh, you know, the the Saxons, it it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The at the end of the day, the barbarian and their lack of civilization is the impeding threat, and so Arthur is this light of civilization overcoming the inevitable. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the that's the thing that like you know Poland had touched on it earlier, where like you, you had the Saxons had ter turned this tale into one of their own. One of the biggest points where this became a very popularized myth again, myth again was during the time of King Alfred. What was going on during Alfred's time? Yes. The Danish invasions of England. Arthur became a rallying cry during that time period time because, again, it's all about standing up to this impending chaos and, hol and holding on to the, the, the fulcrum of civilization. Yeah, and Alfred is, was dubbed Alfred the Great later on. He, I think he's the only English monarch that actually carries that title. You are correct. Uh, right. could call an English monarch, I guess. In it's more dangerous yeah. at this point. And what what year were those Danish invasions? I uh, goodness gracious, uh, Poland! You you'd have that better than me at this. Point. That's like a. That's going to be. Uh, it starts with be the like latest barn. Right. right. Yeah, I think that's going to be around the eighth or seventh century, if I no, remember okay. correctly. A little bit earlier. Yeah, which is again right around the time that the, we had these stories starting to come right back up again, too. Mm -hmm. Seventh, eighth century. That's eight nine hundreds. Cool. So again, we start to see the formation of these the these Arthurian stories during this time of what the barbarian invasion. Yep. Now I did. So, I did wind us on a big. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Michael. Before I go ahead, go ahead. Okay, because I'm going to jump away from this. Careful! I just choked on some water. <laughs> <laughs> you jinxed me, Blue. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you son of a. <laughs> oh goodness. Um. Anyway, hey, uh, okay. So I took us on a little Saxon quest because that that was. Uh, you know, my own personal interest there. So uh, Poland, before we, we get back to the men behind the myth and then the, the reality of, of each date, uh, what do you, do you have anything to throw in there more about, about uh, these barbarian hordes, in fact, being Saxons at one point in time among others and just, you know, anything, any other thoughts you didn't get to spit out? Well, I think to Michael's point, it's very interesting how the tale gets adapted and adopted really. Uh, depending on who the governing power is in the Isles at any point. And you can, it really speaks to the power of the, the myth itself. And you actually get to a point where Anglo-Saxon kings to more ingratiate themselves to the locals start using the name Arthur for their, for their, um, their heirs actually. Hmm. And so, you know, it, it is a very, it carries a lot of, a tremendous amount of weight and it's one of these things that's really woven into england's history much like the, the robust language that's layered with you know uh, germanic celtic latin and then eventually french with the norman invasion uh, in 1066 this is also the way the arthurian legend goes as the as the language builds up the arthurian legend also during all these same phases gets layers 
added to it and it gets adopted and used in different ways until eventually you have what Mike was talking about earlier. You have like this almost Renaissance like tale with knights in shining armor and, you know, damsels in distress. And it has a, a very like Victorian spin on it almost. So and you add in characters like Lancelot for complete and utter self indulgence. French. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But at its root, like Michael's saying, um, because of the the really contentious history of England, even up until this point, because you know, this is still very early on, mm -hmm. you have to think about, you know, they were invaded by the Romans and the Anglo-Saxons. And then throughout up until 1066, you had a huge uh, Norse Viking issue as well. The Danes. Uh, that the Saxons were repelling. And eventually you get to the battle of the three kings with Harold and, and William and uh, the other Harold, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> it, it, the other one. <laughs> yes. So, you know, it's, there is this constant struggle over the aisle itself. So even up right. until this very early period, there is this, there is this theme of repelling an invader and wanting to maintain your national sovereignty. And you can still see that in the English identity up until this very day. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it carries like you even you, that contentious for the, the contention for the British Isle carries on well beyond that. The hundred years war is literally a pissing top contest between England and France over who's supposed to be ruling who yeah. like it. The, the English consider themselves to be of the line of Norman kings. The French consider uh, England to be their right as the inheritors of the line of Norman kings. So it's like it's this giant back and forth. And that's why they hate each other so much. Um, well, that can't be the only reason. I can think of it. Uh, it's a pretty big factor of it. Uh, but like, like, like that, that's the, that's the big, that's the big thing is like, again, in, you know, you look at these things and of, of course, you, you know, you add on the, like what I had jokingly mentioned before, but you have on the add on of characters like Lancelot by the French, who is literally like, what if we made our, what if we took this King Arthur story and then made a knight more cool than King Arthur? Oh, it, like, it, like, like, like that, like it, it all goes, it all goes into that. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to take a look at because it, like, as, as I said, you know, these, these stories become more romanticized as they, as they get pushed forward, but the core to them always stays the same. Who are the people that, that Arthur is fighting barbarians. It doesn't matter who you dress them up as it's always the thing that brings Arthur to power is there is discord throughout England because there hasn't been a strong monarch to unite all the warlords. And so when he d does the trial of the sword and the stone, which we won't go into much today, because that's a whole other episode in and of itself. Oh yeah. Um, but when he does that thing or whatever thing that they have to have Arthur come to power, he unites all of them against the impending threat of barbarians of chaos. It is civilization versus chaos. That is the struggle of King Arthur. Mm. So um, let's get back. That brings me back around. I don't know why to uh, people. And you have four proposed people who may be Arthur. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the first one of Lucius uh, Artorius Castus. I, I yes. said his name in the chat earlier. Whoa, the chat stopped. I think my computer's broken. Anyway, um, we... Uh, or everyone's just lurking. Yeah, every, it's okay. yeah. It, it's, so, everybody just chill. It's it's okay. So, so we had we had talked a bit about Lucius Artorius Castus, and we uh, touched on Ambrosius Aurelianus. There's not a whole lot that we know about either of these guys outside of you know uh, Castus had a brief stint in Britain and ended up uh, holding a governorship in Eastern Europe um, by the time of his death. And then I'm a timeline guy, so do we have years for these guys? But potential ooh. years within a range, and then I know. should. It, uh, that's something that I'll I'll definitely uh, have for next time. Okay, but so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to pin down because, like I said, a lot of this is not exactly recorded. But if you're talking about Ambrosius, that's going to be your fifth century timeline again. So you're talking about the 400, 400 AD 
and then Lucius himself, I assume, would be before that time. Yeah, no, like like you're talking about uh, second, third centuries. Yeah, um, right before the fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, it, like like he he started off as a centurion in like Syria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because um, all throughout the 400s, the entire empire is recoiling and dealing with the, the collapse. But, you know, it's like rippling out and fracturing in its various parts. So every part of the empire is dealing with it in different ways. Um, but yeah, uh, so so that's what we have from that. Um, and we don't we honestly don't know enough about uh, Ambrosius to really talk too much about him unless you have more information than i do Poland. but like everything that i was pulling up on him was very minimal as far as dates and everything was concerned because he's a figure that we're we've been learning more about relatively recently like within the past like 20 30 years in the last century rather actually like yeah, that's, in the 1920s yeah he's like, he's a relatively newcomer to the authorian discussion really um the the next person that we have the more more information about but again it's not anything that we can really uh gauge based off of dates was there was byzantine records by jordanes called the origin and deeds of the goths that uh talked about rio famous and this is where uh a lot of uh we feel that uh, like the the historians think that a lot of the stuff like the the going to Avalon and everything came from. And so effectively, uh, uh, Rio Famous is, state, uh, is stated to be the king of the Britons during this time of uh, the Byzantine Empire. And it was detailed that um, the king, this king, Rio Famous, was besieged by the Byzantine emperors to uh, Emperor to quell rebellions in Armorica and Northern Gaul that were bring, bringing up uh, that were brought about by a Germanic co- tribe called the Britons different than the Britons B R E T T O N E S um <laughs> and so <laughs> Britons, uh, <all> right. yeah. <laughs> this this matches up with uh the Arthurian myths because there's an earlier myth there is a whole thing where Arthur was besieged by the Byzantine emperor when you're looking at Geoffrey Monmouth's uh work there Arthur goes to Gaul twice and one of those times he's being besieged by the Byzantines to help stop this and then uh it is uh like as far as the Avalon myth he was dealing with Germanic tribes in uh, Deol uh, and was mortally wounded in that battle and was car- uh, carried back to a Burgundian town where he would eventually succumb to the wounds. And this town was called Avalon with two L's as opposed to the one. And that's near modern day Bruges. Now, now you mentioned two L's instead of one. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, people pulled out as uh, a... As, uh... Well, okay, if you ever find those people who say that you can put the, the Old Testament on a grid and find codes in it, um, no, because there are too many spelling errors in it in terms of somebody Correct. using two consonants in a row instead of one like Steve N with two Vs or, you know, PH. I'm using English examples instead of Hebrew. So is there really a significance to Avalon with one L versus two? I, I, I think that potentially, because like you, you have to, you have to realize that in a lot of record, in a lot of history, even during back in this time, there was a poetic li- uh, lilt to things, right? And so there was this general, like you look at things like, you look at like, for, for instance, you look at the Herodotus's Persian Wars, right? And Herodotus is considered the father of history. Okay. Herodotus wasn't alive during the Persian Wars, especially not during like, Marathon or Thermopylae or, or what have you. Most of that stuff is based off of hearsay and everything. Things have been built up over time. Again, these stories have been told for hundreds of years by the time we actually start getting any of these re- records being put down. And uh, so when these stories get told and uh, you're some ignorant bum trot farmer that's just passing the word around and paying telephone and you say oh yeah he got injured and was taken to avalon 
and they're like, well, what's Avalon? Right. Oh, Realm of Fairies. <laughs> Fuck it, why not? And, and that becomes ingrained in the myth mm. and, and in the story. Like, like I, I don't, I don't think that it's a, a whole thing of, you know, oh well, this definitely did that, or, or like, there's so much that again we don't know. This is literally throwing darts blind at a crossboard and, and uh, at a uh, at a dartboard and hoping that you hit. But like, there are enough things that that add up here where it's like, you know, some ignorant uh, farmer in England isn't gonna know where Avalon is in modern day Belgium. Um, so <laughs> like you don't really have those answers, but you want to know what sounds cool. The fairies are a very big part of are, are a very big part of Celtic and British folklore realm of the fairies. Sure. Arthur has gone there to heal. And at some point he will come back and he will become the once and future king. Like you, like these are these are the things that this poeticism that gets added into history almost poisons it. Well, we don't want to neglect uh, Royal Themis and before Artur Mac Eden, which I don't know if that's how you say all those accent marks. Our, uh, Artur Mac Eden, yeah, um, I believe, is is how that's pronounced. And so we talked about Rio Themis is the one that, again, you know, that's where we feel that, that, that that's where it's theorized that the whole Avalon myth comes from. And is, a lot of his accounts from the uh, Byzantine origin and deeds of the Goths kind of match up with. Um, now, Artur Mac Eden is an, uh, was an Ir Irish prince of the province in Western Scot uh, Scotland called Del Riada. Um, and he operated between Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall, leading and led a war against the Pites in Northumbria. Um, so the timeline that he was operating in doesn't really doesn't really mix with what is considered classical Arthur, but his influence again is definitely felt there. Like it, like you have. A somewhat similar setting, and Arthur became this myth that was accepted across the entirety of the British Isles, and everyone kind of had their own version of it. So, like, he he plays his part. It's not as big as any of the others, but it's still there. Hmm. All right, I don't even know what to ask you now, Poland. <laughs> um, when we're <laughs> well and. And to, to correct your spell, I, I noticed that you put his name in there. Yeah. It's a uh, <laughs> Artuir is A R T U I R Mac and then space capital A E D A N. Yeah, I put an S by accident. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Poland, you were going to say. I was going to say that uh, Jeffrey's. Um, account is largely considered to be fictitious at this point. Um, while we were talking about Gildas earlier, the monk who wrote about the the earlier kind of Saxon invasion period, his work's considered to be more historical, while Jeffrey's is considered now to be largely fictitious because he's writing about other mythical uh, kings as well. Uh, it's literally a weird version of the Aeneid. <laughs> it's the yeah. best way to put it. I, I was reading it and I was like, huh? Yeah, because it is called the Historia Regime of Britannia, or the, you know, the history, the, the history, history of regimes in Britain, and so it's a little misleading. But yeah, it's it's a largely fictitious thing. It was written during the reign of Henry the First of England, um, and it was this. I mean, this is when you're in the fully Norm Norman period of England as well. Uh, so after the Battle of Hastings and after the Norman invasion of 1066. And, you know, this is really more of going back and a retelling of a lot of history of England and kind of glorifying it because now the Normans are trying to establish this national identity um, because up until this point, that didn't really exist on the island uh, other than maybe during the Roman period. But even then, they were very isolated. Uh, and this is where you start to get things like Merlin, and uh, then a little bit later on, uh, as Michael hinted at, you get the abhorrent Lancelot edition. So 
<laughs> but this is this is where you get some of those <laughs> right. This is this is where you start to get some of those more fantastical elements introduced during this time period. Um, and, that, and that's correct. Uh, Merlin first appears in uh, Monmouth's history of uh, British kings. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is very much one of those things. It, it would, I would liken its writing to what Augustus did with the Virgil. For, uh, like, literally, it's Britain's version of the Aeneid. It's give us our own epic like granted I, like this was this wasn't during a time where these people necessarily had access to things like the iliad and the odyssey because you had that massive loss of information what have you that we that you didn't really see resurge around there or until the renaissance and the you know 1400s um yeah and this was the 12th uh, century early 12th century early, yeah early 12th, so yeah 13 my apologies but like point point is the uh you don't you don't see that there but like it's definitely a whole thing of well i want an epic story about britain figure something out yeah and this is also <laughs> where you get characters such as lear uh Cymbeline, and yeah. uh, a few other like mythical monarchs of the time yeah and popular names too i mean you've we've all heard at least lear uh, with some passing familiarity, but it is, it really is like the Epic of England. And this is, this is the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. No, just, sorry. Correct me. Uh, is <laughs> stories like this get changed? Don't they just because the populace wants their own myths more than it's a top down. Give me, give me a story. Correct. And uh, yes, but I don't like it. Like, I don't think that it's done to that degree on like an official level. Like every, it, it's one of those things where you even look back at things like the Iliad and the Odyssey. So like the Iliad, the version that we have is just one translation of it. It used to be a whole thing where like the the places that all of these heroes were from would be rotated. So like it, with the exception of the Trojan, uh, with the exception of the Tro Trojan antagonist, like all the, uh, all the badass Greek war chiefs, they're their their origin places would get swapped around so like one story agamemnon wouldn't be in mycenae he'd be from athens or achilles wouldn't be from thea he'd be from sparta and it would all get like kind of tossed around in these these festivals and that, and like it, like that's the same thing with arthurian myth as well and that's why you have these very uh, these at times are very conflicting themes where you have this very christian environment but then you're dealing with very pagan elements like uh, looking at things like excalibur and the lady of the lake and all uh, and all these things that delve very deep into the lore of the fae but then you're also having these people claim to be beacons of christendom mm -hmm. kind of weird this this harkens back to something i think poland said earlier uh, I'm dyslexic, so I might be mixing the two of you up. But uh, he mentioned that one version of an Arthurian legend that popped up actually flipped sides against the Britain. What I think I missed. It, it it wasn't that it flipped against the Britons. It was that the Saxons used it as a way to inspire people, despite the fact that it is a very anti-Saxon ah, right. story traditionally. Oh, yeah, but okay. most people regard the roots of it as being against the Saxons, like the whole, the inspiration for it, I guess you could say was in its very first iteration, the Saxons were the baddies, right? Mm -hmm. They were the ones coming in and disrupting the, uh, what would you call it? The, the Britain Romania hegemony at the time. And yeah. so if like Greco Roman, it would be British Roman. Britano uh, Roman. Yeah, Britannia Roman. <laughs> Whatever it sounds the most elegant, right? Disrupting so, the Pax Britannia. Yeah. <laughs> Pax so they were the original ones, but about time you get to Alfred um, in the eighth century, you know, you and he became Alfred the Great. He became the defender of what people regarded as England at the time. You start to see an adaptation of this um, as a tale against now the Danes, and now the Danes are the baddies, and then eventually. You know, the Normans get their turn. Although that was so swift that I don't think that really had any staying power. 
Uh, and then later on, uh, you get all these mythical uh, elements introduced in the 12th century, like we were talking about a second ago during the reign of Henry the First. And that's really more of a solidifying of a national identity. It's like, oh, here's here's this tale that's been handed down all the way from the oral stories of the Celts now to the Norman kings and the Norman kings wanting to demonstrate that they are connected to their people. They, it is in their best interest to say, yes, we also care about Arthur. This is something that is of interest to us. And then they started recording uh, new versions of it as well. Mm -hmm. But in those versions, they are, or sorry, in, in the certain versions where it's used to rile up against the Brits, it's, um, it's more like, victimhood propaganda for lack of a better term <laughs> i mean it, it is what it like it's it's one of those things where arthur has this beauty to it but i mean at the end of the day like a lot of stories and a lot of versions of history it was propagandized it was used to sway certain things i mean like you know you look at things like Herodotus, you look at all of this stuff, you, even when you're looking at like Herodotus's accounts of the Peloponnesian War are filled with a whole bunch of anti-Spartan rhetoric um, <laughs> because what was going on? There was a war between Athens and Sparta. Herodotus is an Athenian. He's not going to be bashing the home team. Um, and so like, like again, you, it is one of those things where there is a there is a lens um, that you have to look at, that that you're getting to look at this through, and it might not be the most accurate lens, but it's the version of the story that we have, because unfortunately, we don't have records from that time. People stopped recording things. There is this whole thing that happened at the fall of Rome. You had this resurgence in, in a resurgence in the old Britannic identities and druids started to come back and everything like that and up until rome history wasn't recorded in the stand way it was recorded through oral tradition it was recorded you had druids that that had kept up with the tradition local traditions and local histories and everything like that and then rome killed all the druids when they came in there because they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't stop inciting rebellion and then once rome left you had this resurgence of druidism and you had this resurgence of the pagan identities and Christianity kind of went away and then, uh, and then it came back. And then that's when you start getting things recorded again. Like, mm -hmm. like it's, it's just one of those things where we're honestly just in the dark about, and it, it like it, 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 the Arthurian stories are fantastic. They're great escape and they're, they're beautiful. They're filled with beautiful poetry. But like at the end of the day, using them as anything other than that, you're not getting accurate representations of anything. Oh, no, um, no, you, I, you'll, I, find, I, you'll find a more accurate representation of a quote unquote, Arthur inspired England in a Bernard Cornwell historical, historical fiction novel than you will in Jeffrey Monmouth's uh, history of British Kings. But we can, we can glean some things about the attitudes yeah. and, you know, being able to now go back and kind of trace the different phases of the legend and peel back some layers of the onion. You can see how it was adapting to a changing England really, and a changing Britain uh, more largely. And what is inexorably tied to England is its national identity and, so goes the legend of King Arthur. Those two, I think, are interwoven in that way because while Arthur is always about, you know, striving for a higher ideal and repelling, you know, foreign invaders and establishing sovereignty, so goes the English identity as well. So I think while you can't glean much historically from the legends itself is in the actual words and events and whatnot. It can give you some insight into what the attitudes were of the people who were occupying the aisles at the time. Yeah, 100%. A little bit of the culture. So um, we've gone through versions and, you know, potential Arthur's uh, is in, as far as inspiring a, a legend, not historical. I mean, you know, real people in history who would inspire a legend, but the legend is not a historical account of them. We got that. Uh, as we're winding down before we gear, you know, before next time. So about what year 
would we say that that these versions started to settle down a little bit and one of them emerged uh, in a more solidified form that is what we could buy today. Like I have my dad's copy of King Arthur and uh, the Knights of the Round Table sitting here next with me, um, assembled or edited by Sidney Lanier, and it's got eight major chapters in it or eight books in it. Um, so when when's the earliest that we really see one of the the solid versions of Arthur come to come around? That would be around 1136 when Jeffrey Monmouth did the history of British uh, of British kings, because that was the that was the first time that we that like. You know, as, as we said, yes, this was a highly political piece, but this was the first time that we really had the whole Arthur becomes uh, king. He's the son of Uther Pendragon. He unites England, repels the Saxons, gets Excalibur, does this, does that, go uh, goes off and does what have you, and then has to go fight Mordred, gets uh, fatally injured in that final battle and gets taken off to Avalon. And so that's the first like story that we see really the birth of the Arthurian myth. This is Jeffrey Monmouth's uh, Historia, um, goodness gracious. <laughs> Historia Regum Britannia. Uh, yeah, H H Historia Regum Britannia, yeah. Gee, okay, so we've, we've hit a lot of 500 and 800. What? 1100 is where I start to pick be, to become aware of things better. But Poland, to close this out, what were some of the major events going on in the 1100s? <laughs> because this is going to be preview. Where, where do you time. want us to start? I know. <laughs> it's like, it's like I need, a, need to take around? off my hat and, and pick yeah. things out. Is, isn't this when the Crusades were starting? That's right. Yeah. So you had a very... <laughs> You had a very fractured Europe at this time, uh, as you might imagine. And the church was trying to get its footing as well. The Carolingian Empire had since faded. And so now you had warring monarchies, like these little fiefdoms almost. And the the Pope's solution was was to declare the, the First Crusade uh, during this time period. And that's probably one of the more successful ones if you're to look at what it set out to do actually. And it did briefly stop everyone from fighting because the Norman invasion of England in 1066, that was a pretty big deal. That was a huge, that was a huge shift change um, in kind of the power balance really of what was going on in Western Europe at the time. Um, and what, meanwhile in the East, you still had the, what we know is the Eastern Empire, which had briefly tried to prop up the West during these earlier time periods we were talking about. Uh, they are coming into their own as a more Greco-Roman civilization. So they're moving, so the, the terms almost become interchangeable. The people inside the Eastern Empire almost see themselves as Greek in culture, but Roman as citizens. So they, so you get, the, you get this term Greco-Roman, and actually even some Eastern churches today you'll see terms like Greek Catholic, even though they're not Greek, they're referring to culture, they're referring to the Hellenistic uh, traditions and whatnot. And, and so that's Catholic, what you have. Not, not to be confused with Greek Orthodox. Those correct. Are... Yeah. yeah, correct. So you have, that's an, that's an identification with the culture inherited from the Hellenistic tradition, you know, that very rich history that people like to cling on to. Cause much like we were discussing with the Arthurian legend, everyone wants to have a strong identity, right? With their, mm -hmm. with their culture, with their nation, with their kingdom. So these are, this is where you start to see a lot of these kingdoms seeking that out. Like this is where you start to get your, your proper Englands, you know, as we would know them during the, middle, the medieval period, your proper France, uh, you know, German, that's going to take a little while longer before you get to them. But this is where you start to see a lot of these, these bodies and these entities begin to actually develop into their own sovereignties as we would know them. And I mean, really, this is what's gonna launch us on the trajectory towards eventually the Renaissance period and the rediscovering a lot of these artworks and whatnot. As, as Europe itself is starting to dust itself off, the church is establishing itself, there are records being kept, there are schools being established, cathedrals are being built. And you know, this is really a time when everyone's picking up the pieces and trying to find their way. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. 
Uh, so we'll leave this on a hopeless note of everything is falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was thinking, so, you know, when, when Paul and I had talked about this for the live shows that we do, we we're mm -hmm. thinking about seeing if anybody in the audience had any questions. Um, so before we wrap up, let's see if there's anyone that has any comments in there asking about stuff. Let's see, yeah. I've had a lot of fun uh, saying things kind of, you know, half acidly, uh, just knowing that this is not going to come out right. So I'm not even going to try to make it sound smart and just let you guys correct me. And it's worked. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. But yeah, if anybody has any questions, please throw them in now um, before we wrap up. I didn't think we'd cover this much in one day. I really didn't in just one episode. But in future episodes, we may pre-record them so that we can uh, just you know premiere them and uh, and whatnot. But do some of them live, some of them pre-recorded. I don't know how often we're going to uh, do these, as far as every you know week or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll we'll get that ironed out. But like it, but, it's been a it this has been awesome. Like this is so cool, and I I you know, Poland and I have been uh, bouncing some ideas off each other for like future episodes for for this uh, for this series on arthur in particular mm -hmm. um and uh you know we'll we'll figure out if we're going to pre-record them what have you which might even be to our benefit as we can do some like severe a video editing what have you <laughs> uh, yeah. on water yes that would be good <laughs> yeah and, and yes. what we really want to get across with this series is that you know stories matter I think that also, you know, for all of us who have been brought together by comic books up until this point, you know, there are things that we inherit that are somewhat intangible. And I think King Arthur really speaks to that. I mean, it wasn't written down for centuries and centuries. And eventually it manifests as this, this story that really captures your imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we go through history, you know, we used to call this in our history classes SFF. SFI, which is specific factual information, you know, dates, names, places, and all that sort of thing. Like those are important. Uh, but at the end of the day, even when you're looking at actual history, it is all about constructing a, constructing a narrative of some type. And that really when you are going through and doing historical research, if you're not able to dis describe a narrative that you're piecing together through research and information mm -hmm. and evidence, then people just don't find it very interesting. They find it very dry. So, you know, as we go through these fictional stories, you know, you may begin to see some intersection between what we're discussing in terms of the fictional stories and actual the actual record itself. Mm -hmm. you know, it's funny. You and we did get a question here. Uh, yeah. If we want to pull that up, it's from Jason Black. Yeah, I'll get, um, I'll get that in a sec. Um, just real quick. So uh, you use the word narrative, um, Poland. It's funny to use that term because there are almost three uses for it. One is the philosophical sense where it's, it, it shapes a worldview. And the other is, uh, you know, a sequence of events like, like historical narrative, which maybe has nothing to do with worldview. But then at the same time, we also have narrative in the fictional sense, which is really close to the historical use of it. And um, I just wanted to let, to point out that we're really not using it the same as the philosophical sense, which is really popular to use uh, nowadays. That's right. But, okay. Uh, Poland, would you read Jason's question for uh, our, for uh, what's his name? Should I, should I read it all into read the it. mic? Like all, yeah. read it really all close. sensual like? Read it like a Kiwi. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. I'd like to ask if you have a real sense of Arthur's character. I see him defined by his temperance and leadership. What kind of dude was he? I don't know if I'd agree with that. Um, Arthur, one of the things that I, I really like when I delve back into Arthur is he's not very temperate. Um, in fact, he's a man that's very much governed by his emotions, and that's what allows him to inspire. Um, it is also his fatal flaw. He is at times very arrogant. He is, uh, he's the, the whole point is, is he's the boy king. Um, so he makes a lot of silly decisions um, that are rooted in how he feels instead of tempering that, those feelings. Um, 
like you look you look at things like uh especially when you're going because like when you're just looking at like the base like stories of like origin and what have you, you don't you don't get a lot of it but when you look at things in the later stories uh you uh, um you have the story for instance of how he gets excalibur he's he's just he's just gotten his ass kicked by the sable knight pelinor um Pelinor broke his original sword. He gets Excalibur. He goes, he fights Pelinor again and wins with Excalibur. And then Merlin poses him the question of if you were to keep one between Excalibur and her sheath, which would you choose? And without even taking a second to think about it, it was like, please, Excalibur, look at it. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. She's, she's indestructible. There's no finer edge. And he goes, well, then you are a fool because the man who wears her sheath will never come ha- or shall never have harm come to them. And this was a whole teaching point. Arthur is not um, like every, every hero should have a, 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 a character flaw. And I think that temperance is Arthur's. Our Arthur goes 100% in on everything that he does. And it's both the thing that inspires his knights. And it's also the thing that gets him killed. You know, he he doesn't fight Mordred with caution. He under he underestimates him, and he get uh, Mordred gets a lucky hit on him. You know, he consistently wants to believe in the better uh, in the better qualities of his uh, half sister Morgan, and what she do? She almost gets rid of Excalibur. She she tries to get rid of Excalibur, uh, but she she doesn't have the time, so she gets rid of his sheath. Which leads to him being pervious to harm. Mm. Like he is a man governed by his emotions. I don't. I don't think I would have temperance, but leadership for sure. He's he's very charismatic. Um, that was the the big thing. So is that? I, I mean, in in terms of uh, stories, what Poland said earlier about stories being reshaped for their time and, and use, and uh, you, know, you mentioned it too. Uh, here Jason continues with that in movies I've seen Gargoyle's TV show he's always the archetype of a perfect king is that is that because of uh, the oh geez I must be tired and hungry the last thing you just said about um, oh crap I can't remember your last words I'm nervous <laughs> but uh, is that because we focus on those because that's what we need I I think so well because uh, like like you look at you look at what heroes are uh, from a narrative standpoint, and they are the embodiment of traits that we hold value in as a society. And then you you look at uh, the the King Arthur myth, and the whole thing about King Arthur is everyone thinks that Arthur's reign was a utopia. No, it was a just rule and a just time. Mm-hmm. That's the that was the whole thing was that there was still injustice. The but the thing was is that Arthur did his best to fight against that he wasn't perfect and so this idea of him being that perfect archetypal king that that we see in modern media i feel is way is way more geared towards what we feel that we that we need from that myth than what the myth actually was you know um, you, you like, a, cause I know exactly what he's talking about with Arthur when he shows up in gargoyles and what have you, like, like he shows up and it's the whole once in future King storyline. He's coming back to, to the world. And it, the, you have the whole aspect of Arthur where when he comes back, there will be a reign of prosperity that lasts eternity kind of deal. And so they really showcase that. But like, when you look at these stories, if Arthur came back to a modern day, he'd not really be celebrated. <laughs> like uh, the way that he dealt with stuff was very good for its time. But like you think about the stuff that people need for uh, from their governments today, and he'd just be like, "No, that's <laughs> that's not just. That's not how a just king rules." And it would be a complete different clash of ideologies. Uh, and so, like, there's a there's a lot of that that we kind of project because we have our own needs from our heroes for what we want to inspire us. 
But when you go, when you, it's the same thing when you go and look at these older stories. They're like, Hercules isn't what is portrayed in the Disney cartoon. No. Hercules is a horrifically tragic figure. Yes, he does really impressive stuff, but the man murdered his children. Like he was driven into a fit of rage by the goddess Hera, and he murdered his wife and what, seven kids? Not a happy story. But again, we have this expectation from our heroes where they need, especially in today's society, where our heroes need to have this ideal life that we want. And that's not a bad thing, necessarily. But it's also not authentic to who they are. I've heard, uh, in terms of the fiction, I've heard uh, RJ, the guy who runs the Fourth Age, a very intelligent guy, uh, well-studied, I should say. He, um, yeah, th Jason Black's says, great answer. Thank you, by the way, uh, uh, Arthur Nutt. <laughs> I want to call you Mike, but it says Arthur Nutt. Anyway. It's, uh, it's fine. I, I'm going to have, this is going to change every single time that we tackle a new mythology or new story this is going to be this is going to be different because it's my role my role in the show is to be the guy that knows the story yeah so um but our, our, what's his name rj put it very simply that it used to be one of the thumbnails i took from him was it used to be that that the hero was the more virtuous and the villain was less virtuous i'm sorry more moral and virtuous and the the villain had lower morals and virtue and so i it, it seems to me that what we need uh, as far as what shows up in our stories uh, to answer what to answer that need for some is always somebody more virtuous than ourselves to look up to, even though we might never attain it, we still need to look up to it. But I'm, I'm yeah. finding that uh, anyway, Poland, before we close out, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, unless anyone else had any questions, I was just going to say that this was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I haven't gone over my early English history in quite some time, so it's always fun to revisit because I find it fascinating. Like I said, it's kind of a seven-layer cake of culture, and I mean, really, I think it it lends to the strength of the the English culture and why eventually it would become ascendant because it did go through so much early in its history. It was able to adopt so many things from these different invaders and whatnot. So. I've always enjoyed this time period, and I think it's one that goes a little neglected a lot for the reasons that we've mentioned, because it's difficult to dive into. There's mm -hmm. not, there is a lot of blank spots in there. And, you know, it's, it's kind of tough, and sometimes you have to make leaps or inferences based on accounts that came much later. But I think it's a time that's really valuable, because like I was saying earlier, you see the fledgling kingdoms that begin to take shape in Europe, the fledgling church, a new... Uh, a new order taking shape in Western Europe after the fall of Rome. So I think it's a really crucial time period and one that gets a little overlooked at times. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Are there any book re recommendations for a new, well, blatantly King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, but <laughs> there, there are different people who have, uh, I don't want to say translated it, but it's kind of like translating. Um, well, it, different interpretations, I, I would I would call it. Um I mean, my, my personal favorites uh, are uh, the, the first King Arthur book that I ever read will probably forever be like my favorite, uh, King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Um, beautifully illustrated, phenomenally written, re uh, really brings you in on it. Uh, Thomas Mallory's The Mark Doctor is also really good. And uh, if you're looking for like a more authentic to period, one that I, I think does an absolutely fantastic job and has ascended to like my top three uh, books, book series on Arthur, uh, Bernard Cornwell's The Warlord Chronicles, which is The Winter King, Enemy of God, and Excalibur. An Enemy of God is probably my favorite book that that man has ever written. And that's saying something because he's fantastic at his job. <laughs> that was a lot at once uh, without typing. So I've got the three authors you named Wait, you named four authors, didn't you? And Jeffrey Chaucer also contributed to, oh yeah, to it as well. Yeah, uh, Jeffrey Chaucer had it, had a whole thing. So Thomas Mallory's was Lamore, uh, uh, L A space M O R T, D apostrophe R T U R. Mallory is the first appearance of Lancelot, I believe, as well. I, I yes, he is. <laughs> and Galahad, I believe. Yeah, Galahad, who is Lancelot's uh, son, but is also awesome. 
Can I just leave this um, up with Thomas, Thomas Mallory? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can do Thomas Mallory, and then Bernard Cornwell is his series is called the Warlord Chronicles. The first book is Winter King. The second book is Enemy of God, and the third book is Excalibur. And these are based on uh, researched legends or... So, so Bernard, Bernard Cornwell is a British historian. Okay. And so what he did was he went through and did research on like, old, like it, his book take place into, in, a, in a version of Britain that is very shortly deprived of the Roman Empire. There are still traces of it and everything, uh, but it's, uh, it's very much steeped in that like 5th century fall of the Roman Empire uh, resurgence of Druid paganism and everything like that. And you get a lot of these classic Arthurian stories with a, a bit of a more historical twist. It's a reality-based retelling. So, like, there is quote-unquote magic, but, like, the way that it works is to these people who have no idea about, like, modern science or anything like that, it's like, oh, my God, what's going on? But, like, you and me as a modern real reader will be like, oh, I know what that is. That makes sense. And it's just, it's a cool literary device that he does. Um, but uh, it's absolutely fantastic. It's it's one of my favorite uh, takes on Arthurian lore. And I'm crossing my fingers because uh, allegedly one of the big uh, primetime TV companies has got the rights to make them into a show. And I'm really hoping that they do it justice and don't screw up like how Netflix recently screwed Blast Kingdom. No so <laughs> <laughs> cool well, all yeah. right thank you guys we don't want to go over 90 minutes we don't want to wear out the audience um and i'm going to have to re-listen to this to to catch a lot of the details that i missed live uh, believe it or not even when you're just a panelist and not running the stream it is hard to catch every detail live uh so i'm gonna go back but if if anybody in the audience has questions for for next time or whenever we can get around to questions there's my email address in the chat it's blue samurai zero at protonmail.com uh and notice there are no underscores there in the actual email address so it's easier to type uh so anyway you can email me questions and i'll pass them on to these two guys to to juggle and we'll pick up with the 1100s and arthur and and more of the the, the uh, story itself i guess next time whenever that is yep. So thanks for everybody being here, Poland, Michael. Godspeed, everyone. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Have a good night, everyone. Bye bye. Oh, I click it twice. Okay. <laughs>